We're going to be talking about, um, I don't have any cliche Christian terms or anything, but uh, like him. I just want to be like him. I've been listening to the song here again. You know, not for a moment was I forsaken, the Lord's in this place, and just wanting to be with him at all times. And <clears throat> the reason why I'm talking about it is because I've kind of been noticing with transition comes war. Uh, and you're not going to escape the war. But the one thing I'm going to encourage you with, especially with the sermon, I hope, is that even Jesus going through transition, going through the warfare, going through the struggles, going through the pain, the suffering, the beatings, the, all that stuff, he still accomplished his ministry. He still got, accomplished what he was here to do, which that's a promise to you, too. If you're called and you're called to do business or ministry or whatever, God will accomplish what he's going to accomplish through you. Amen. Yeah. So don't focus on the situation. Focus on the end, what God is bringing you to. Amen. So you don't miss the blessings or the teachings or the lessons that you're supposed to learn. So let's, uh, I think uh, more often than not, transitions can bring a lot of different things out of you. Do you guys know what I'm saying? When stress hits you, yeah. the real you comes out. You know what I'm saying? The real you comes out. Like maybe you lack the, the, the faith to step out and transition. What I mean by that is this may be your first time that you're going to step out in something. Maybe it's, like I said, business or a new job or a promotion or like us having another building. Uh, you know, a lot of us are transitioning into things. But most times I feel like when we approach God, we want him to give us a clear picture of what our lives should be. And what I mean by that is this. You know, before I relocate, I need to know my job. I need to know how much I'm going to get paid. I need to know where I'm going to live. I need to know, then I'll go. That's not faith. That's assurance. That's assurance in what you can think or do, right? And so, and that's not bad to ask for, I don't think. But like, if you, if you notice in Genesis 12, and to Abraham, he said this, go to a land that I will show you. He didn't say, I'll take you to a land that, I, that, 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 that you already know. He said, go to a land that I've shown you. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men, he says in Matthew 4. He didn't say follow me because you're already fishermen. He said, I will make you fishers of men. So when you step out in faith, God is making you into what he wants you to be. So when you're in a position or a situation where you're like, I don't know if I can step out in this. If you're called to do it, I promise you, when you step and you can't see it all, he is making you the person that he's already told you that you would be by his word. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's continue. Some things in our lives feel right and some do not. Do you guys know what I mean? Some things right now, especially in transition, feel good. And then there's things that don't. I want everyone to close your eyes for me. I got a little exercise. I mean, a physical, like not physical exercise, mental. <laughs> Because we ain't doing that Sunday morning, right? <laughs> it's a little early, mess. I want to challenge you on something. Just close your eyes, and I want you to analyze your life. And this is a broad question, but I'm going to have a point to it in a minute. Are there areas that you know that you know aren't being Christ-like? I want you to reflect on that for a minute. Whether, it, Again, we're talking about transition and what it brings out of you, so there's a point to this. I want you to open your eyes for a minute. Actually, for the rest of the sermon. Why do, you think, <laughs> why do you think this is? What makes us not sometimes want to change how we feel about things? Do you guys know what I mean? Because maybe it's familiar. Maybe it's because we're just used to it. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's easy sometimes to get mad. It's just easy to get frustrated. And you're kind of used to doing that instead of repenting before God and saying, Lord, that's not the way to go. You know, so why is it easy to hang on to things? And one thing I want to say is, we have to continue to remember our first love. Transition, you can easily lose your first love. Let me get into this for a minute. This is going to be a sermon, not just to point out errors, but it's an encouragement. So I want you to hear this with a heart of openness. Like, I'm not here to cor just correct and all those things. That's my job as a preacher, but I really want to encourage you into the faith that this transition for you is the right move. Do you know why? Because of the war. Because of what you're dealing with, because he's sanctifying you, because he's putting all types of filters, it feels like, on you. And he's just constantly crushing you to the ground sometimes, right? And there's times where it's easy, and we'll get into that in a minute. So one thing I want to say is don't miss God in this transition. Amen. Don't miss the Lord in the transition. And what I mean by that is if we, we won't, we're not going to miss him if we're constantly seeking him. That's true, right? But there's times we miss the Lord and the lessons we're supposed to learn for the next season, if you don't learn them here and now, you're going to take that thing you didn't learn into the next transition. Do you guys get what I'm saying? If you don't learn it here, if you're not ready to be sifted here, that sifting that you didn't allow to happen will carry into the next season, and it'll be harder for you. It's honest, right? <clears throat> so we're going to talk about Revelation. When God speaks to the church in Ephesus, Revelation 2, 
two through five. He says this. I mean, we all know this one, but just hear how this is written. He says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. That's amazing. He knows what they're doing, why they're doing it. They don't tolerate evil. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and that they're not. And you found them to be false. And you've pers- you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. So in other words, you've done this all for me and have not grown weary. He said, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you've fallen and repent. Do the deeds which you did at first or else I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Here's the thing, though. They did everything right. They did everything right. Matter of fact, even down to when apostles would come, they would try them. And if they weren't true apostles, they'd boot them out. They're false teachers. So they went that far where they're not even tolerating evil in the pulpits. They're, not, they're doing everything correct, but they forgot their first love. And the word first, I just looked up the word first just because, it means preceding all others in order of time. Preceding all others in rank, dignity, or excellence. First love. Is your love to God first in rank, dignity, and excellence before anything else? This is a good question. I started thinking about this because it's easy for me to get up in the morning to go do my job. I was just telling Pastor Todd this morning, it's easy to take for granted. You just wake up, you start to pray, you get your day moving until you're hampered by pain. You can't control. Until something hits you in your heart and you're like, man, I, I, I took that for granted, Lord, for a long time. And I can't do it anymore. There's, I can't move or, or shift out of this position. And uh, <clears throat> is your pursuance God, or do you seek him before you act, you react, even before you transition? Have you sought the Lord through this transition? Have you really dug deep in your heart to say, Lord, I need you and you alone? Because it's easy for me to listen to what I know and go through this transition, but I'm telling you something, if you listen to him, you will be on a sure foundation. If you listen to yourself, it will be shaky and it won't be uh, proper. It won't be laid proper. You have to listen to him. So here's some ways you know that you may have forgotten your first love. And the reason why I wrote these out is because like, Lord, I I literally uh, three, three, three days in a row asked myself these questions. Lord, I need to be honest before God. I need you to sift me. I need you to sift me. Do you have a greater or weaker sense of your need for God now? Because it's, it's cool to come to church and, 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 and sing. And I think to myself, you know, I do that. I need that. I need that refreshing. Lord, I need a fresh wind. But what happens on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? Are you... Uh, uh, Are you more cold towards God and less passionate about spiritual things than you once were? Has church, prayer, worship become a routine or a religious act to you? They become monotonous. In other words, we know when we come in here, worship's banging, baby. And we're going to come in and worship. That's what we do, right? We know there's going to be prayer and times for prayer of healing. Amen? That's good. But has that become monotonous to some of us? Has that become a routine to some of us? I don't ever want that to be a routine. I don't ever want to come in here and think, here we go, another four songs, which will be about 45 minutes. I've timed this, by the way. Four songs, about 45 minutes. Todd will get up, do his little thing. Pastor Jan will preach a little sermonette. And then he'll come up here, preach a sermon, about 30, 35 minutes, rock and roll. Because it, be- it can become a routine. It, be- it can become something monotonous. And then sometimes I find my mind down there when I'm sitting there wandering. Wa- I'm wandering on, okay, what's going on in the service? Are we watching for this? Are we doing for that? Gosh, I got to go on on Monday and do this and this and this. I forgot to send that email on Friday. Oh, you know what I mean? Because monotony has hit me sometimes. And God love it that he let me repent of this. Because I don't want to forget my first love. I want you guys to notice something. When we read Revelation 2, notice what he says. He goes, I know your deeds. I know your work. I know your perseverance. I know that you've hated evil. He never one time said, I know your obedience. Never once. He said, I know what you're doing. But he never said, I know you're obeying me. You guys hear what I'm saying? I know that you're doing good things, but have you obeyed from the heart? That doctrine that was once delivered to you, he says. <clears throat> are you asking Christ, are you asking God as Christ taught us to give us this day our daily bread or are we relying a little too much on the mentality that this is what got me here so I'll keep doing it? 
I need that daily bread all the time. I need daily fresh. Do you guys know what I'm, do you guys get in this? Like we need daily manna every single day. I can't depend on yesterday's prayers. I can't depend on last year's anointing. I can't depend on what I thought was right last year. I can't do the same things in the new building that we're doing here in this building. We got to build here so that when we go there, it's already on a sure foundation, sure footing. We're moving forward. Same thing in business, same thing in your family, same thing in anything that you're doing right now. Here's uh, kind of one of the examples of how works and, uh, works and perseverance clash. If you guys remember the story in Numbers 20, when Moses was told to speak to the rock and that it would give water. Do you guys remember the story? Yeah. Moses, speak to that rock and it'll give water. Guess what he does? He gets frustrated, yeah. strikes that rock twice, doesn't he? Yeah. Yes. It poured out water. Yeah. It fed the people. But he disobeyed. He didn't obey the Lord. How many of us in our trials, in our situations, through this, we strike the situation instead of speaking life to it? So instead of speaking life to your mountain, saying be removed, we go try to rent a bobcat that's super small and try to move the mountain ourselves. How many times have we done that where we're like, you know what? The Lord's not moving fast enough. I'll do it then. Don't forget the Lord and all of his benefits. He said, didn't he say to honor him and glorify him in the book of Psalms. Yes. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Don't forget his benefits. Don't forget who he is. <clears throat> and I'm pushing all of us to remember our first love. All I want us to do is to be known fully of him and to know him fully. That's all I want. Guys, ministry's fun. It is. I love to preach. I love to be up here. This is the first time I've ever said that. I was, I'm usually scared to preach. But I actually love doing it. I love being around you guys. I love knowing that here, like, there's just always something that happens cool, you know? And there's always something new every week, you know? Some kind of challenge or trial or something blessing, some blessing comes by. I love that. But I want us to keep remembering our first love. And since this is about being like Christ, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. How Christ went through his own transitions and how he handled them. How we're supposed to do it like him. Do you guys remember when he got baptized? John the Baptist. Christ at the beginning of his ministry, Matthew 3, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. So in other words, John the Baptist said, wait, 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 you should baptize me, man. And he's like, no, 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 no. So that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled and prophecy would be fulfilled, you must baptize me. John the Baptist is like, yo, I can't even like unlatch your shoes. You did a whole sermon on what that shoe thing meant, right? But yet he still baptizes him. And here's where it all starts. The transition starts. This is when his ministry starts to begin. Matthew 4. Right after getting the word of approval, once he gets baptized, God says to him, what? Well done, thou good and... This is my beloved son, I'm sorry, in whom I'm... I said the wrong verse. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. How many of you guys like a good encouraging word? He got baptized and the Lord says, that's my boy. And I'm so stoked for him. That's my, that's, that's my boy. That's my son. He's me on earth. I am so blessed. His ministry is about to begin. We get a good word, right? This is your time, man. This is the season, Come on. right? For such a time as this, this is your word. And you finally have gotten that word. And then he was led up by the spirit to be tempted of the enemy. And he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he became hungry. And the tempter came to him and said this, if you're the son of God, doesn't the tempter come to you and say, if you're really God's kid, wouldn't you? If you're really God's kid, command this stone to be made bread. And Jesus said, what's the, what's the word? Man shall not live by bread alone. But let me, yes, yes, let me challenge you. How many of us who tra transition learned this? That everybody that said they'd be there for you wasn't there. Or that provision that was supposed to come in for your ministry, your business, whatever, didn't come through. And so guess what we do? Man, they, they said they would help. So maybe if I go to the bank quick and get a loan and blah, 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 blah. Maybe if I blah, 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 blah. Maybe I'll throw it out on Facebook. I'll throw a Hail Mary. Someone will come. We rely on our mental intellect. We rely on our flesh to get something done. And yet, what does Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread or flesh alone, but by every word that he said. So if he said it to me, he's gonna complete it. 
Be encouraged that when you're forsaken, he's there. As a matter of fact, when you're forsaken, that's where he gets glorified. He doesn't want you to glorify yourself or your situation. He doesn't want you to come back and say, well, sure, good thing I sent out that Facebook post. No, good thing God came through anyway. Amen. And it's in a better foundation. And your testimony will then be of what he did through you, not what you did through you. Come on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Be encouraged. Because he said, man doesn't live by the flesh alone. I can't live by my carnal reasoning. What does the Bible say in Romans? The carnal mind is an enemy of God. And we don't want to live in there. If we're going to truly walk in faith, that means walk in faith. There's no method to that. You know, as a matter of fact, it was Benjamin Franklin. I've used this once before. He said, to see through the eye of faith, you must first shut off the eye of reason. If we're going to see through faith, you can't have reason in it. Faith makes no sense. To the flesh. But you rejoice in the spirit when God speaks a word to you. There's something unique about it, man. There's something unique about it. Here's another one. Uh, so he, he tempts him with that. Money running low, all that stuff. And then he said, uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread or flesh. And then verse 5 says this. Then the devil took him into a holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you're the son of God, then throw yourself down. Ever feel like quitting? I didn't think that was going to be that blunt, but <laughs> he says, throw yourself down. Give up, buddy, because the angels will catch you anyway. Right. How many of us have said to ourselves, I'm going to quit ministry because God loves me anyways. And he'll catch me. I'll quit this whole thing because guess what? God loves me anyway. Didn't he just tell him if you throw yourself down, won't the angels come to get you? What did he say after that? He said, it's written. He said, if you ever feel like quitting, I've, and some of us even say, I've missed it. I missed it. I went way, too pa went way too fast in this. I missed it. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord to the test. But I like this version better. It says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Don't tempt him in thinking that your carnal reasoning removed you out of this and saying, well, the Lord loves me when it was your carnal reasoning that did it. Because if God called you to it, see yourself through it. Get in prayer even more. When it becomes harder, why is it sometimes we run away from the Lord instead of run to God? When it becomes where we're like, Lord, I've lost you in this whole thing. I don't know where you're at. Sometimes we're more recluse than go to him. When he told us that he's given us the grace to approach his throne boldly before God. That's where we should be, that when it gets difficult, that when things are starting to hit you, that when you can't see the end and you want to quit, now's the time to run to him. Amen. He's going to answer you, I promise. Do you know how I know that? Because he gave you a word to do it. Amen. So he has to answer you. He is not, listen to me, please hear me on this. If there's one thing you can get out of this, he is not a man that he should lie. He is not a man that he should lie, and he has never lied to me. Never. Everything he said he would do to me, he's done with me and more. Amen. Everything he said. And it's awesome to see it. And it took longer than I thought. Sometimes I went around the mountain a couple of times. How many can attest to that? I didn't learn my lesson. And so I took him for granted. And I thought, you're not answering me. You must, I must have missed something. Until I ran to him and he showed me where and I turned around and I repented where that was. And I said, Lord, now show me. And he's done it. And he's proven himself faithful. Now's not the time to stop. Now's the time to stand. Come on. Now's the time to stand. Here's another one. He said, uh, where am I? Oh, verse eight. The devil took him onto a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Worship actually means, if you look it up, our works to the Lord, our service to God, our works to the thing that we do. So we could worship like the Olympians. I'm not saying Olympians are bad. That's what they do 24-7. That's all they focus on, right? That's their body is their thing. So that's what their works are. That's what they're dedicated to, right? So he said, if you just worship me, <clears throat> when we learn to use reason through transition, we lose his word. What happens if we start worshiping? what we know instead of trusting the word of God. 
So then Jesus says to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. How many times have we catered to our own flesh sometimes in the midst of transition? Where all Jesus had, the encouraging thing out of all this is, if you're not in the word, get in the word. Because everything he told the Satan was the word of God. Amen. So when you feel alone, you're feeling dry, you're feeling all this, the word of God Amen. is where you stand. Amen. Everything that he went through, he, he justified, he did by the word of the Lord. As a matter of fact, quoting it to John the Baptist saying, so that scripture might be fulfilled, baptize me. That's how well he knew scripture. Do we know scripture that well? But we can quote it and say, you know what? In the midst of trial, Lord, this is what your word says. This is what your promises say. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? And, And so I failed many times in this. But you would think after so many transitions, I'd have got it by now. You'd think, you know, I've been to, I've had, I've had several ministries, a couple businesses, uh, started pastoring three and a half years ago, almost four now, jeepers, four years, I'm getting old, and four years now that we, we, we started pastoring here and, and all these things and all these transitions and something new always pops up and I'm thinking to myself, I think I'd have learned that lesson by now and sometimes I didn't. Do you know why? Because I didn't learn the lesson, I relied on the flesh and those things are coming back now to see again. In this transition, does this make sense? So I'm learning now, I can't rely on what my mind thinks or what the flesh thinks, I have to rely on the spirit. That's a cool graphic. I just want you guys to know and keep remembering your first love. Here's another way to be like Christ. His transitions from his earthly ministry to his crucifixion. So he's already been doing this for three and a half years. He's about ready to be crucified. So Matthew 21, he has this triumphant entry, right? And everybody's coming. He's like, hey, sends two of his disciples, go get that donkey, go get that colt, and they'll know, what you're, they'll know what I'm talking about when you tell them this. I mean, isn't that trippy? What if God told you to do that? I want you to go to that dealership or whatever. I want you to tell them this, and they'll give it to you. I was thinking about Hosea, Georgia. I was thinking about you had to hear the voice of God to marry a harlot. You have to know the voice of God. You do. You have, so God is telling him, or telling these disciples, go find that donkey and coat, tell him this, and he'll give it to you. You got to know his voice and counter discipleship. Check it out, 7 o'clock, Sunday night. Oh, <laughs> At this point, he was anointed and he was being told, all hail the king of the Jews. Didn't we just sing that song? All hail King Jesus. All hail the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews is here. This is it. His triumphal entry and he's there. All of a sudden, he gets that cool word. Everybody's loving on him. Jesus is here, man. And then he starts to do what any one of us would do in a revival. Cleaning house. Goes to the temple, throws out the money changers, right? He's going bonkers. He's like... Get out of here. I'm going to restore this. I'm going to do that. Then he's in the synagogue the next day healing people. When he's in the synagogue, he's probably preaching. So he's probably teaching too. So he's not only cleaning house, getting everybody out. He's preaching, casting out devils, healing people. This looks like a good old-fashioned revival, man. Woo! Let's move. And then... Matthew 26. So for five straight chapters, all you're reading are these parallels about the kingdom of heaven. All the while Jesus knowing he was going to be betrayed and crucified. Knowing that he would be betrayed and put to death for something he didn't do, he still ministered to his people. How many of us know that even though someone wronged us, we can't minister to that person? Because we hang on to bitterness. Oof. How many of us have been wronged? Let me tell you something about Judas. God chose him. He knew he would, that Judas would betray him. And some of us will still hold on to bitterness. And here's Jesus saying, nope, he's still here. And he still used him. And he still ministered with him. That's insanity to me. Because our carnal reasoning would say, I can't trust that person. There's surely no way I could trust this. So Jesus was on a roll. Everything was moving forward. Then the plot to kill him. But he just got the word that he was the king of the Jews. This is supposed to be a glorious time. And he acknowledges that one of them would betray him. And he had known this the whole time. And he chose Judas. And he says, 
eventually they'll all fall away from me. He told them all that. He said, eventually all of you are going to go. Can you imagine that? Your homies, your pals that you've been chilling with, you're going on doing discipleship with, and you tell them from God, I know you're all going to leave me too. But you still continue to minister. You still continue to be with them in the fight. I'm like, man, Lord, I got a lot to learn from Jesus. A whole lot to learn from my father. He has the last Passover and institutes the remembrance of him, the communion. And through all that mess going on, he's still ministering to his bros. Jesus goes into the garden. He begins pleading with God, take this grief, this pain, this burden. Take it from me, Lord. And he said, nevertheless, not your will, but my will. Or no, sorry, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That would have been bad. What I'm kind of hitting with this one is, do you remember when his disciples were supposed to go out there and pray with him? And they couldn't, and they didn't, and they fell asleep? All those people that forsook you. And then he went back and he reminded, he, he goes, I know, you screwed up, let's go, get back in prayer. You couldn't watch with me for an hour, come on, let's go. I need you to pray with me. I need you to be with me in the, in, in the fight. How many of you guys know we might have been wrong through this transition? Can we see them as the Spirit of God Seize them, is the question. Then Jesus stands before Caiaphas and Pilate and his accusers for things he did not do. And he was accused, spit at, mocked, beaten. In other words, he was publicly humiliated and didn't say a word. He took it because he knew what his ministry was, to die for the sins of the world and resurrect in glory. What if through this transition you're being mocked you're being ill-spoken of. All these things, people are forsaking you. You're being put in front of counsel for something you didn't do. And you're supposed to keep your mouth shut to let the glory of God flow. But you try to justify yourself because our carnal reason gets in the way. How many have done that? Oh my gosh, not only have I done that, I would find scriptures to justify, to justify my anger. Lord, didn't you say in the book of Psalms that you would break the teeth of the wicked? Did you not say, Father God, that you would condemn the tongue of those who spoke against your righteous? How dare they touch God's anointed? <laughs> Here's Jesus, man. Here's Jesus knowing he's going to the cross. And he says this statement that made him a redeemer and not a condemner. Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. Because they don't know what spirit they're operating in. They don't know what spirit they're under. And guys, I'm telling you, in a transition period, there's been a lot of subtle division happening. Backbiting, stupid little nonsense things, things we're hearing from other people. Hey, these people are saying this about you. We're going to leave the church. So? So? We have a mandate before God to put the word of the Lord and the spirit of God together and to have people get an encounter with God. We don't have time to focus on the flesh here. We don't have time to focus on things that don't matter. What we do have time for is lost souls. If we were focused on souls, we would not have the problems we have in churches because we're doing the work of the Lord. If we were focused on souls coming in and getting healing, we wouldn't focus on who left us. If we were focused on the things of God, we wouldn't worry about what people say about us. If we were like Christ, we would focus on the kingdom. Don't lose the Lord in the transition. Don't lose the Lord in the transition, right? Do we remember our first love? I love that he wanted to see his kingdom of God advance. Jesus, that's all he wanted. Now, maybe some of these things are happening in your life. Maybe some of you are struggling to find your place in the kingdom of God during this transition. Maybe you haven't rejected, I'm sorry, you haven't re reacted well. And maybe you've rejected people for wrong reasons. What I mean by that is you're rejecting people, but you don't even know the full story. Have we done that? Have we held on to things that don't matter? <laughs> maybe you got into some ridiculous arguments or needless conversations that only cause strife. Maybe you thought of quitting. Maybe you've never been healed from past things that now are easy triggers for the enemy to gain ground in your life. Maybe, just maybe. Everybody stand. Where's the prayer ministers? We need prayer, man. I want to cast this stuff out. I want us to move in clean. I want us to be like Jesus. Because that's all that matters, amen?
And there's a lot of us that are talking about this and we're hitting this and we're seeing this and we're not willing to be honest. I'm honest before God. I've seen it happen. I've dealt with it. And I need prayer and I'm calling all my friends who pray, dude, I'm going through this. Man, I'm struggling with that. I don't understand here. And I don't want to walk into a new season with old things. I want us to walk in a new season with things that are from the Lord. Like it says in James, pure wisdom. Maybe, maybe it's time to ask the Lord for a new song again. Maybe it's time to ask the Lord for, give me something new, Lord. Maybe it's time to ask the Lord for a fresh baptism in your life. Lord, maybe it's time to ask for that purpose in your life. Maybe ask the Lord about things that frustrate you instead of consulting yourself for the answers. Maybe it's time to ask God for that gifting that you desire to serve the body of Christ for the kingdom. Maybe it's time to seek the Lord in new ways you never have before. And I'm talking about crazy ways. Why not? It's God. Maybe he's waking you up at three in the morning and you're not listening. I go through it. Maybe, maybe it's time to get more serious about our walk with the Lord. Maybe it's time to let your flesh die and let your faith arise again in your heart. Maybe it's time to get on your knees before God and ask him to return to your first love. Maybe Jesus just wants us to be more like him. So all these things are happening because he wants you to be more like him and he's revealing things that aren't like him. Does this make sense? So what you're going through in transition is not bad. He's revealing things in your heart that aren't like him so you can remove those things to be like him. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to pray. Father, I just bless this time. Lord, I pray they received what you wanted them to receive. Father, I just pray for your holy anointing. Father, I'm thankful that you're cleaning house in our hearts. You are totally cleaning house in our hearts. You're making us like you. You're making us holier. You're making us more righteous. You're causing us to have more grace in your sight. Father, you're causing us to have more faith because guess what, folks? That's what we asked him for. So he's given it to us. Father, I thank you those right now that need prayer, that need to get rid of these things, that need healing, they would come to the front right now in Jesus' name because now is the time to do it. Father, I, I thank you for our new season. I thank you for the transition. I thank you, Lord, you found us faithful to do it. I thank you for those going through transitions in their businesses, those that are getting job promotions, those that are moving into new houses, those that are in new relationships. Father, I bless them by the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name and that you would cover them, Lord, and you would unite their hearts with you in Jesus Christ. Father, again, we bless your name in this place. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.